Welcome to our Azure Incident Retrospective. I'm David Steele. I'm Sami Kubo. We work in the Azure Communications team. In addition to providing a written post-incident review after major outages, we also now host these retrospective conversations. You're about to watch a recording of a live stream where we invited impacted customers through Azure Service Health to join our panel of experts in a live Q&A. We had a conversation about reliability as a shared responsibility. So this includes our learnings at Microsoft, as well as guidance for customers and partners to be more resilient. We hope you enjoy the conversation that follows. Super. Today, we're going to be focusing on an incident that took place on the 19th of September. We were conducting some upgrade work for our data center capacity in the West Europe region, and inadvertently, there was impact to a subset of storage nodes. Now, because so many services depend on storage, this had downstream impact to SQL databases, uh, databases and virtual machines. That's right. So to talk us through the impact and our learnings, I'd like to introduce the engineering leaders joining us on our panel today. Uh, first up on, uh, to my left here, we've got David Gothier, the GM of our data center, Critical Environment Systems Intelligence. It's a great title, David. Uh, and on the end, we've got Michael Myra. Michael is the general manager of the Azure Storage Platform Systems. This incident involved both our on-site data center teams and impacted storage. So these are the right folks to talk us through it. Super. David, maybe we can turn to you first. Yeah. Before we get into the incident itself, before we talk about what happened in September, we run a hyperscale cloud around the world. Surely we do upgrades and increase capacity all the time. This is, generally speaking, this is a routine operation. Is there anything that we should watch out for when it comes to um, sensitivities that we're, we're, we're usually pretty careful with these? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, as you can imagine, running hundreds of data centers, millions of servers, there's upgrades happening constantly, right? It's painting the Golden Gate Bridge. You get done with one thing, you're on to the next thing. Um, but but kind of in actuality, like the way that like these network upgrades work and these network cabling upgrades work is most often tied to deploying new capacity or a kind of intentional lifecycle refresh. And those those happen without customer loads and customer impacts on the machines, right? And they're also very change controlled and structured with Michael's team and others to roll through. Um, in, in this event, we were doing upgrades kind of at a node level, at a rack level. Those are super uncommon. And, um, and because of that, our teams are not also super strong at them, to be honest. Like, it's just not a regular task for us. And so one of these infrequent rack upgrades um, that we were rolling here, um, as we we're coming through, they needed to do work at the rack level versus at kind of the cluster level. So that granularity difference is kind of what triggered us here. Got it. So this, this wasn't kind of some of our usual cabling work. This one was a bit more rare than, than we usually do. I mean, the cabling work itself is is exactly the same. I mean, as far as every one of our deployments, we go through a pre-cabling activity where they're they're running cables in the baskets and they're prepping them for deployment and they're kind of tying them off and and keeping them secure. But they do not plug them into anything active. Um, and in this case, because we were we had work that needed to occur in production racks. Um, they needed to get into the production rack to do that securing of the cable. Got it. And again, that's that's not super common for us. So that's that's what we're talking that's about. That's good to understand. That that's, uh, explains why it was a little higher risk than usual. Uh, Michael, I'd love to bring you in here. Now, I think we mentioned in the post-incident review maybe that, that different kind of storage hardware were more or less sensitive. But talking to you just before the session, it seems like uh, often all of our storage is temperature sensitive. So what, what made this kind of unique about, about this hardware? I think the nuance that was trying to be conveyed is um, any type of work that would interrupt airflow within a server leads to a situation where you can have an overheat condition where the system shuts down. In this particular case, because of the cabling uh, procedure that David was alluding to, the back panel of fans on a chassis was opened up, which prevented airflow from going through that entire unit. Okay, that's good to understand. So that, that's kind of why it impacted storage here specifically. Yeah. Yeah, so if, if we could fast forward to the incident itself, so so when then there was impact for storage, what did customer impact feel like? Was this widespread? Was it quite contained? Was it intermittent? Was it persistent? This incident um, progressed as people doing the procedure within the data center were working through the racks, the situation escalated. Um, typically, our systems are designed to be able to be very resilient to different types of failures. We can have uh, media like SSDs and hard drives fail. We can have nodes fail. Even entire racks can fail. Uh, we have a very durable uh, erasure coding mechanism where we can rebuild data as it fails. However, in this case, the amount of failures um, were catching up with what the system could handle. And at first, what we would typically see the customers experience would experiencing would be increased latency and reduced throughput um, for their different services that depended on that data. 
And at the point when the system um, got to the point where we didn't have enough uh, data fragments or code fragments to reconstruct the data, we would have temporary data unavailability. And that's the point when VMs would shut down or we may lose access to a SQL database um, databases or also uh, premium blob storage in this case. Right, so that's good to understand how that happened, David. Yeah, I was going to say, and, and as, as Michael was saying, this the, you know, the the removing of error moving through the servers really is kind of the heart of this. And so, as these cabling upgrades were were progressing, this this particular generation of hardware, um, the the cables kind of run through the chassis, and so the technicians were kind of coming from rack to rack. They'd done all their pre-dressing of the cables in there, and they were going to run it through this chassis, which requires opening up this fan door, running it through, closing the fan door, and then leaving the cable bundle ready for the next step, which is a change managed, like evacuate tenants, maintenance activity with with uh, with Michael's team. Um, and so that, that fan door is designed in a way that can be opened, and it can be opened during operation, um, but it shouldn't be open for more than five minutes. Now, in many cases, that door was open for less than five minutes and we, we feel okay-ish about it. And in some cases it was open for as long as 32 minutes. Right. And so this work happening sequentially across the racks as they're they're doing these fan doors is what manifested sequentially in the in the storage fabric. Right. Now it's you know, we're talking about this with the benefit of hindsight here, but at the time we didn't fully understand how that was even happening. So I mean, given that the issues kind of happened and then seemed to self-resolve, you know, how did we maybe we'll start with you, Michael? How did we initially detect what was happening here? How did we go about investigating it to be able to figure out that, that it was related to these these fan doors? Um as I mentioned, we had individual nodes going down, but when it gets to the point where we run into last data uh, chunk available, uh, we, we move into a situation where the system starts going through a high priority reconstruction of the data and eventually to a point of data unavailability. Um, the time to detect that, we actually were aware of the problem within one minute. Um, at that point, a live site was set up, a bridge was established, and we had people working around the issue. Uh, now, as the technicians continued their work, however, um, the situation was escalating. And at that point, what we did is we reached out to our partner teams um, to have a joint uh, organizational investigation uh, of what happened within the site. Right, David, what is the yeah. data? Where do you stop? Yeah, so this, this kind of like investigate, so this kind of escalation in our data center and management team is pretty common. There's things that we detect ourselves at the data center level. There's things that we work with our, our, our partner teams to, to, to detect and they bring to our attention. Um, in this case, we we quickly engaged. We got the 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 site team, um, you know, in place to investigate quickly. They looked at a bunch of their automated systems and like the the the, the telemetry and information they had about the work happening in the data center, and it was like, hey, there's nothing going on in this cola right now. There should be there shouldn't be someone in this data hall, um, and so it's it's likely something else. And we said, okay, cool. But we you know, out of an abundance of caution, we sent technicians out to to the space. They went through, they visually inspected, they said, hey, everything's running, the lights are blinking, the fans are moving, the air is going. Um, and so we're like, okay, something else is happening here. It seems like the equipment has recovered itself. It seems like it's coming back online and rebooted. And we confirmed that with telemetry and with Michael's team um, and kind of assist recovering storage. Um, where, you know, as we were doing the parallel of that, we're starting to investigate because now we're now we're all interested in what's going on because this is a little bit different. Um, and it came up as we were talking uh, with Michael seeing that there was a similar set of kind of recent reboots in U.S. South Central that hadn't run, totally run to ground yet. And we're like, well, that's interesting. This is very similar to that. It's happening on a different continent, different zone, right? And so we, it turned us on to looking at a logical change as being what drove uh, the event. And so we spent some time digging into, uh, you know, did we have firmware updates? Did we have OS patches and, and, and updates that could have triggered this kind of rapid thermal rise that kind of rebooted and went away. Um, and after we would kind of run that to ground, um, we was like, okay, hang on, let's go back to first principles here. Let's look at the CCTV camera. Let's look at the, 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 the video of what was going on in the colo. And that's where this, this work about the pre-cabling came up. And, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't well logged and well tracked in our automated systems. The, the, obviously the team doing the work knew about it, 
our, the deployment side of our business knew about it, but when our break fix teams and when our folks who were doing incident investigations needed to find out about it, it wasn't immediately visible to them. So that's incredible. So after the engineer who did the, up, uh, the upgrade work kind of moved on, then an engineer came out, had a look, and there was no one there, and a little bit of cat and mouse, and then it took CCTV footage to, to yeah. go in and check out. That's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Surely when you, when you think about moving forward now, like incidents happen, the repair items that you have, have you sat down and said, okay, we're going to revise our, our operating procedure for when we touch racks that are sensitive? I mean, is it storage in particular? How are you upgrading, or what are the, oh, yeah. Uh, what are, yeah, how are you upgrading your SOPs? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, first, I want to acknowledge that you know, there are a few things here that didn't go right, and and like fundamentally, we had a process escape that allowed physical work to happen on production assets without all of our change control and change notification approvals going in the process. Um, you know, and 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 further that we also had data center staff who were who were executing this pre-table cabling work who weren't super as familiar as they could be with the end-to-end, -end, every task, every risk that could manifest during that activity. And then I think the last kind of learning for us is, is around, we overly trusted our automated systems. Um, and so, um, you know, ensuring that we have the work visible to the people who, who need to be able to respond in an incident is super key for us. And so what we, what we did after this is we, so one, we issued a global stop work order. I mean, first thing we're like, hang on, something's not great here. We're not going to do any more pre cabling activities anywhere till we get to the ground of this. Um, we're also kind of um, changing our workflows, work orders, work instructions on our upgrade types of processes um, such that, you know, they're, they're, tied specifically to the specific IT equipment and a specific upgrade scenario that they have, right? The technician needs to be working from a task list that is, um, you know, specific to the hardware and specific to the steps that they need to get done. Um, and that needs to integrate with our standard change management process. So those are all in, pla in place right now and are, we're kind of going through training and kind of rolling those out with the techs. Um, but most importantly, like we're using the exact same change control process we use for I need to do power maintenance or I need to do network maintenance and these other things. So we're using the same change control mechanisms that automatically feed into uh, the rest of Azure's fabric for, for coordinating change. It, it's, re it's really interesting hearing about how you say, you know, we, we trusted our systems too much. And then we speak other times about we trusted our humans too much. And it just reminds me of the, the delicate balance of human intervention and, and system control. It, it's a balance. I don't think there's a, a perfect answer, but it's an interesting yeah, observation. Yeah, it, it takes a village. Right. Yeah. Very good. It, it takes a village. Michael, we'll bring you in here as well. Were there any learnings or repair items from the storage side? Or were you just kind of victims of the, the data center team? Here? No, I mean, you know, uh, important communication is always important. And anytime we deal with any incident, we always do a very detailed internal assessment and postmortem. And one of the key things we want to focus on is um, doing what we can to improve the steps that we take to um, move through the incident, both the time it takes from detection, from realizing that we're in an escalating situation, to the time it takes to call partner teams to move through the situation. Every minute counts. For our customers and those are the areas that we focus on is just getting this the systems back online right being able to recover when there are inevitable right. issues there okay makes sense to me so you, you speak about every second counts and there are customers who put their mission critical workloads and then they depend on storage and some yeah. of the things that storage depend on if customers is there anything they could have done if they would grs or zrs would have helped because this was isolated to one rack at a time would, would that have helped customers that's a great question we'll this throw acronyms in there we might have to I'll, apologize i'll help out that so that's a great question. This incident was specific to a single zone within a region. And one way customers can protect against this is persistent storage should be um, zone redundant. And there's different ways to do that. If you're using a, 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 an object storage account, you're gonna wanna uh, set it up for ZRS. If you're using Azure uh, SQL uh, database, which is our, a PaaS instance effectively, you can set that up for zonal redundancy as well, and it'll automatically duplicate compute and storage resources across um, zones. And if you're using um, SQL Server on um, Azure VMs, likewise, you can set up those underlying storage to be zonal redundant as well. So the, the key thing here from an architectural perspective is to set things up that way. And from a compute side as well, you can also just, even if you have stateless VMs, it makes sense also to run those zone as well, possibly with load balancer, Azure load balancer on top to ensure that you're not disrupted at all when these types of instances happen. Cool, and that's a great summary of some of the, the benefits of availability zones to kind of 
represent independent power network and cooling precisely to defend against data center level failures yeah. like this one. Very good. Uh, that's cool to understand some of the learning from the data center side and from the storage side. Um, I've got to save my last question for my co-host Sammy. Sammy runs our incident communications team. How did we do during this incident? Were we able to keep customers up to date? It sounded like some of the teams didn't know what was happening until we investigated. I mean, it's interesting. We, we have our system called Brain and Brain will uh, automatically communicate to impacted subscriptions pretty quickly. And, and Brain did communicate, but it communicated late. Uh, the reason is brain works by aggregation. So in the beginning, when uh, some of these storage nodes went down, it was very small impact, the onesie, twosies. It was pretty small, but brain didn't have enough signal to kind of um, aggregate and then create a, a communication signal. However, as this continued throughout the data center, and as we started hitting some impacting uh, storage nodes, which had a, a, a bigger dependency, customers and SQL and VM, Brain said that did start communicating. Now, Brain communicates very um, rudimentary data. This is, hey, it's an us problem, not a you problem, and it stops customers from troubleshooting their apps and tearing down their infrastructure. Because we didn't know much, as the incident, as the incident progressed, we did tell customers what we knew, but it was very little. In the PIR, we just kind of summarized what happened, and we said we were going to go away and find out. And then we did ship the PIR in time, and, and we did mention, hey, the CCTV was the was the thing that led us on to finding out this. But I mean, it, it, we want to put faith into our brain system, which was great at communicating. Um, but again, we need to do some tweaking with aggregation so that the, the initial customers might not have had um, the onesie, twosie customers that didn't get communication straight away. But as brain aggregated the signal, it would have happened. The other problem with brain as well, because it's not great at aggregating, we did communicate multiple tracks tracking IDs to customers. So initially customers were having tracking ID, you know, for example, one, two, three, four, and later on we pointed customers to another tracking ID saying this is the one to monitor now because Brain's been firing off separate event IDs. Kind of tough to correlate them together here, but, but good to understand that. And I guess this is another example where, you know, the whole point of our incident communications is to let customers know what we know. In this case, that wasn't very much, but at least for future incidents, making sure that you're, you're plugged into that really helps. Cool. Thank you for watching this Azure Incident Retrospective. At the scale of which our cloud operates at, incidents are inevitable. Just as Microsoft is always learning and improving, we hope our customers and partners can learn from these too and provide a lot of reliability guidance through the Azure Well Architected Framework. To ensure that you get posted incident reviews after an outage and invites to join these live stream Q&A sessions, please ensure that you have Azure Service Health Alerts set up. We really focused on being as transparent as possible and showing up and being accountable after these major incidents. Whether it's an outage, a security or a privacy event, Microsoft is investing heavily in these events to ensure that we earn, maintain, and at times, rebuild your trust. Thanks for joining us.